people, um, for those of you who have never heard of the word purépecha before today, sometimes um, we are called tarascos, which is not the, the way that we, um, the, 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 the name that we use for ourselves. We're an indigenous group in West Central Mexico, the largest uh, Mesoamerican society. According to the 2005 uh, census conducted by Inegi in, um, in Mexico, there are approximately 105,000 purépecha language speakers today. Next slide. Some of the research questions that I took a look at for my field work and that I'm, um, that I'm engaging with in my book, how does the phenomenon of plain Indian or going native manifest itself in Mexico? Why do mestizos tour the Purépecha Days of the Dead? Why do Purépechas view, or how do Purépechas view mestizo tourists? Um, are Purépecha people performers uh, complicit participants in tourism? And or how do they challenge the appropriation of their traditions? And how is indigeneity constructed and performed in Mexico? And in turn, how is mestizaje constructed and performed in Mexico? Next slide, please. So the first uh, question that I want to address uh, is kind of a little bit of context to something that my colleague Karen, Karen Mary was already speaking about, which is how did uh, you know the Days of the Dead uh, also become an exported um, tradition um, from Mexico? Um, in terms of understanding Hanitzio and um, Purépechas and why there's such a large draw of tourism to this area in Mexico today, it goes back to the 1930s. The Mexican government established cultural missions uh, to bring uh, indigenous people out of their backwardness in this region. And Mexican um, uh, anthropologists established what was known as El Tarasco, El, Pro El Proyecto Tarasco. There is a series of fictional films. Here I have a still from the film Maclovia, which uh, featured uh, Maria Felix. Um, released in 1948, this romanticized the island of Hanitzio as a place where traditions were still pre-colonial somehow, a place where kind of like culture stopped and life stopped and that you could visit to kind of have this experience with, um, with pre-colonial indigenous people. And then U.S.-born anthropologist George Foster carried out his fieldwork in Sinsun San in, uh, from 1944 to 1946, and he sent this ethnographic analysis of Urepechas out into the world. In 1961, um, there was an ethnographic documentary called Rituales Tarascos, um, and it was uh, and it was after that um, documentary in 1964, this festival of music and dance was instituted in Hanitzio, and today this festival continues as one that draws from Purépecha communities and Purépecha performances to draw um, tourism, tourism specifically to that to Pascuaro and um, more largely to Michoacán. Next slide. I want to start with um, giving you a little bit of context of Purépecha views of life and death. Um, I'm going to read the creation story, and then you can follow here um, this, uh, this diagram. In the beginning, only fire existed, only Curicaqueri. This fire created four concentric circles, which generated the four cardinal directions. Curicaqueri created the sun, Juriata, whom he named father, and the moon, Cutsi. The union between Juriata and Cutsi birth or Acha, the force of the universe, generator of harmony from whom everything originates. Kurika Keri sent four lightning bolts to Querachped, placing one on her forehead, another on her heart, one on her hands, and another on her womb. Querachped became pregnant. On earth, she or they gave birth to the mountains, the oceans, the lakes, the trees, and flowers. She or they then birthed the animals, and finally humans, upon which she or they bestowed knowledge. She called them Purepechas. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, Purépecha views of life and death, Purépecha ex existence is understood on three different planes. The first is Aruandaro, or what we would understand as heaven, um, which is inhabited by deities representing the sun, the moon, the stars, and small and large birds. The second plane is Echerendo, um, or the earth, which is inhabited by people and sacred terrestrial deities who are present in the spirits of animals, mountains, large rocks, bodies of water, and in the air. The third is Kumichekwaro, the, the dwelling place of the deities who govern the world of the dead. <clears throat> like the Christian how the Purépecha underworld is a place where darkness rules and shadows live, a place that the sun cannot reach. But unlike the Christian hell, this echoes um, something that Rebecca said earlier too, the Purépecha underworld is a place of work and pleasure and rest. It's not, to, <laughs> not necessarily a negative place. <coughs> Excuse me. Each of these different planes um, <coughs> also has the corresponding uh, <coughs> directions, um, the, uh, the cardinal directions in them. So, and each of the cardinal directions and the center all have these corresponding colors that I have on here. Next, please. <coughs> I'm going over here. 
Um, the process of burial, a burial or um, hatsintani, which literally translates into being replanted or being relocated or heading downwards into the earth, is very sacred for Purépechas because it symbolizes being replanted into the into Mother Earth. And here, instead of giving you a picture of a of a grave site, I'm giving you a picture of um, of a campesino planting into the earth because this is the way that Purépechas imagine <coughs> burial. Purépechas believe that the Creator live lives within the earth in Cuimichecaron, not in the sky. Thus, being replanted into the earth is representative of the last stage of life. It, uh, it means that you're going to reunite with the Creator. So, despite the start, the its darkness, when we check out as a place of pleasure, a place for rest, as I said before, it's a sacred place understood as um, Purépecha's closest interpretation of heaven. Next, <clears throat> Purépecha alters and believes in the in the afterlife. Um, this is from archaeological work that was conducted about um, with uh, examining Purépecha tombs. The afterlife was one where spirits continued carrying out daily activities such as working, drinking, playing, and co coexisting as they did on earth. The Purépecha departed belonged to communities and continued to live in villages and carried out daily work just like living Purépechas did on earth. There were different destinies corresponding to, more, to a moral code for each departed person. So, um, for example, <coughs> the privilege of reincarnation into human or animal form was reserved for children and warriors. And uh, while, Purepecha, while children were buried with objects such as obsidian, copper, bones, and pottery, um, adults were buried with common objects to be used for daily activities they were to carry out in the afterlife. And in terms of the body and the way that it was split up, it corresponded um, the different uh, planes that I just examined. So the spirit continued to roam the earth, the, the flesh um, went uh, into the um, earth to feed it. And um, and uh, and the bones were replanted to continue to produce life. Next slide, please. So, next slide. <laughs> um, in terms of the the analysis that I am engaging engaging with as I um, embarked on my journey. Um, through Hanitzo during the Days of the Dead in my field work, I'm inserting a political analysis that is not present in terms of how indigenous communities are toured um, in, in Mexico, both by foreign tourists and by mestizos um, and mestizas who come from the cities to tour there. It was an interesting phenomenon for me to grow up with because I always wondered why, as Mexicans, people were not inclined to stay home <laughs> since it's supposed to be a tradition where we engage with our own ancestors. Oh, thank you. Where we engage with our own ancestors and um, and observe, you know, um, build altars for our own antepasados. So why were why are people so inclined to go specifically to indigenous communities? So um, part of the analysis that I am engaging with is I'm seeing Purépechas function as surrogates, um, surrogate stand-ins, living Purépechas for their dead ancestors before the tourist gaze. So um, a colleague, a Hillier. Um, Tinoco, she has um, actually analyzed the way that uh, Purépechas are racialized. These are the features here that she says comprise authentic Purépechisidad. So be, people's dark skin, people's features, traditional clothing are read as live representations of the remnants of the pre-colonial past. Next slide. Um, and I have some examples from the field. So one of them here, since I had a close encounter with death, this is an informant, a, a tourist informant. Um, from Cuernavaca, Monica, I wanted to come to Michoacán for spiritual renewal and to see how the ancient Mexicans deal with death. Next slide. Um, this is Armando from Distrito Federal. Before we used to think that progress was good and desirable, but in reality that is not true. In reality, the humble conditions they live in are better. I hope they keep it that way. These were things that were that were uh, repeated by um, mestizos who were in Michoacán at the time that I was conducting my interview. Um, where they uh, expressed a desire for Purépechas to live a very simple life and, um, and to still have traditional housing and to kind of to like live in adobe housing, for example. When I spoke to Purépechas, there was a critique of that because they're interested in continuing tourism, but because they want to modernize their homes, they want appliances in their homes, um, they want to be able to send their kids off to college, and that's what they're using the money for. So there's kind of like this contradiction there in terms of the expectation of what's going to be experienced in a Purépechas community or home and what um and uh <clears throat> what purepechas want for themselves which is to be seen as contemporary beings with um with you know economic and political priorities next slide 
<clears throat> Mestizos that I, I found in my field work also see themselves as respect, respectful cultural brokers or intermediaries between Purepechos and foreign tourists and as participants in a traditional Mexican event that belongs to all Mexicans. So since, since Mexicanidad is a common thread woven throughout the days of the dead, mystic tourists do not see their participation in Purepecha specific events as act, acts of appropriation. Next slide. Uh, so here's one example from Armando. Yesterday there was a woman with her shawl completely indigenous. She extended her petate to hold vigil throughout the night over her departed relative. She was the only family member present. She was fixing her candles and all that. She was the ideal model for any photographer, including me. From a distance, with respect, I zoomed in and took a picture of her. But I noticed a lot of foreign people, surely more than one, who got way too close to her to take a picture. They stepped all over her relative's tomb. That told me a lot. That told me that it was a, that it was a nuisance to Purepechas. I mean, you're just respect to this woman's privacy in that moment with her dead one. I did it from far away and with thoughts of respect and using the Zoom. The other ones did not, and even without knowing her, that instance told me that foreign tourism is a problem. I analyzed this ethnographic moment as um, with where the, the zoom of the camera lens becomes a metaphor for that mis, for that mestizaje um, <clears throat> functioning as an intermediary position, where um, this this analysis of respect or, or giving respect uh, is still, um, for Purepecha it's still a, uh, a violation of their privacy, no matter where you take the picture from, right? But, um, but you know, to kind of see this as like, I saw people trampling, but they were all foreign tourists. And for my uh, participant observation, that wasn't true. Um, there were Latinx tourists that were all over people's graves too. So, so that was interesting to me. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide. And then in terms of how Purepecha's view mis mestizics, I'll end with this. Um, they, uh, they're complicit in tourism. They're keenly aware that they function as a spectacle during the days of the dead and that tourists view them as different or less than. Um, they understand that the state, the local government and local com companies appropriate their cultural symbolisms to attract tourists to the days of the dead. Um, and they see their communities as cohesive, morally superior, and, um, and, and, and also very rich culturally. And they see mestizos who come to their um, events to try to experience pura pechecidad um, and, and who have this idea that they're going to be ex um, experiencing pre-colonial Mexico, which doesn't exist anymore, as very lost people. Um, I'll end with uh, with one more ethnographic stor story from a um, medicine, a Purepecha medicine man who told me that, um, <clears throat> you know, he understands that desire, but he doesn't know how to doctor it. And so he says, you know, like, um, I understand because Spain is really, really far away, so they can't go all the way over, over there, right? So they have to come here to our communities to try to gain some answers and to try to get an approximation to indigeneity. Um, but um, but I don't have the solutions for these large questions around identity, um, you know, that I, I can't, I, there's there's not any kind of ceremony that I could do to resolve all of that. So that leads me um, to conclude and, and what my book is going to be about to really analyze how we haven't dealt with that rupture caused by colonialism um, and with um, mixed race, the, the issue of, of mixed race emerging from rape in Mexico. Um, and uh, what does it mean to practice then um, true solidarity with indigenous communities um, whose very identities are also being commodified um, as, uh, as mestizos people? What does it mean to have these relationships and to enact them in a, in a way that is actually empowering to indigenous communities versus, um, you know, taking? So I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.